You all right? Yeah, not so bad. How are you? I'm not too bad at all, thank you. Good, good, good. Yes. The, sun is, the sky is blue, not a cloud to spoil the view. Yeah. Yes. And we've been reading. And 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 that's again mis quoting songs, isn't it? Because yes, yeah. I'm great, I'm fantastic. There's not a cloud to spoil the view, but it's raining, raining in my heart is the bit that everyone misses. And that song is about being sad, not about being happy. But that's another discussion that we were having earlier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't think that was sort of like the um, flight control tower, sort of like giving him directions there. Right? I shouldn't, should I? That's, that's that was the big bopper interrupting the pilot. Yeah. Um... So anyway, well, actually, I mean, the interesting thing there is, if if that had been the case, then he would have had to have given us those lyrics when he had died. And the only way we could have possibly have got those lyrics would have been through a spiritual medium. Um, through a last seance. Through a last seance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Look at this. So we, yeah. We're almost professional. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's almost like there's a scriptwriter been in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Starting and booked off, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, we're just, we, I, I'll explain to the listener what was going on. Right? I don't like just leaving it on in-jokes. Me and Ash were having a discussion about how many things nowadays where people will pick and choose the quote without really looking at the rest of what the character means. Yeah. So they'll pick they'll pick characters because they think, oh, that's a really empowering sentence to use. And actually, if you read the actual text it comes from, that's not what the character was saying at all. They were actually doing the complete opposite of what the the quotation is meant to is being used for. Um, and I was discussing it with some music as well. I've noticed it with adverts a lot where they use music because it sounds nice, but they haven't actually listened to the lyrics. So, I mean, I'd used some of them in a sort of like, um, when I was promoting conversations with dead serial killers, I'd taken different quotes like John Wayne Gacy saying a clown can get away with murder. Yes. Which in, I mean, he didn't get away with murder. He was sort of like tried for it. And um, I think he's dead now. Is he dead? Is I he think he's dead him? now. Um, so, yeah, he didn't actually get away with murder. Um, but it's sort of like almost whimsical that you can um, directly quote these people. And it still looks... Odd. Um, who was it? Was it Ted Bundy who um, believed that um, he was going to go into politics, um, but then he decided that um, he was going to do something that's not quite as mean spirited. <laughs> <laughs> and is that? I mean, sometimes it is that kind of like taking the joke the wrong way, isn't it? Or you know, yeah. looking at the context of things, and to actually say that in the, in the form of serial killers. Oh yeah, Ted Bundy was only joking. You know, he wasn't actually. You know. It, it even mm -hmm. sounds wrong to even say it that way, doesn't it? I mean, I've been watching Dharma on Netflix. We enjoyed it. It's a bit long. It's a bit long. I I I appreciate that that what they're trying to do is put more of a spotlight on the victims and stop Dharma being the hero of the story, you know, the anti-hero of the story, so that people stop worshipping him. Don't call it Dharma would be a good one to start with. And then um, Evan Peters in the starring <laughs> role who looks fucking gorgeous. Yeah, it, well, it's, it, well, Dharma was a good-looking fella, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, you know, he didn't really need the drugs most of the time, from what I can hear. But the and it uh, and it does go back and repeat itself, which is quite nice and very stylistic. But it does feel very padded. It feels padded, and I don't. If it feels padded, it's not really drawing me along all the way. Um, for it, so it's beautifully acted, beautifully shot, beautifully written. The the scripts, I cannot complain about the dialogue, but I think there have been too many thoughts about how to make this deep and meaningful, right? And it and it comes across a little bit tedious because of it. So two more episodes to go. Um, seems to have picked up pace a little bit, which is quite nice. So we'll see how it goes. Enjoy it. I yes. hopefully will. Have you watched it already? Um, bits of it, yeah. Tracy was watching it and I fell asleep through a couple of episodes and um, lost interest and then I think I turned up for the final one. That's uh, what I mean. Is, is It has that kind of ability to do that. Where really it shouldn't. You know, yeah. it should be more engaging with the with the way the victim... The best one so far, uh, with no real spoilers going on, is uh, I've just watched the episode with the deaf fella. Tony. Yeah, Tony. And... 
that was a brilliant episode. That was how it really should have focused on the victims rather than I think the way it was doing it just to call back on it in the last few episodes. I think that was, if you were going to choose some victims, these are the most heartbreaking victims. That's the way that they should have done it. But apparently they didn't remain very true to Tony um, for how he was in reality. I've got to watch my particular... My brain is going to a particular joke that you could only use in the 1970s right there. Um, um, but yeah, apparently there's been an awful lot of fictionalising around these stories, um, which, again, doesn't seem quite true to the whole cause. Of, um, I mean, you don't really need to fictionalise it to make Dharma look like a toss point. You just need to sort of like... <laughs> Say, yeah. I mean, it's true though, isn't it? He, yeah. Well, let's he, let's face it. In Dharma, they haven't actually fictionalized it to make it more sensational or exciting. Um, no, but I think with Tony's story, they sort of like tried to bring in this. Oh, look, everything could have changed if he just sort of like um, latched onto the fact that there was a potential romantic relationship here. In that case, um, he could have sort of like settled down and put his murderous um, Roip Norways behind him. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then he thought, forget about that. Yes. Yeah, because he probably had his own drink. Oh, I'll have my own drink and forget about that. You know. Anyways. Anyways. Right. Ask me the question, Ash. Ask me the question. Question. Colin, what have we been enjoying this week? I'm glad you said that. And actually, by some sort of strange, spooky coincidence, we've already mentioned it, funnily enough. Well, this yes. week, we have been reading uh, The Last seance by Agatha Christie and uh, this is going to be interesting because I'm going to do my synopsis based on the actual text and I know you haven't actually experienced the actual text this week have you you've been listening to a radio fire adaptation is that right yes yeah yeah from from 2003 which I know is a more contemporary version yeah. of it called contemporized it so basically um he said suddenly realizing that his notepad they go really professionally moves into a more in a prominent position you have a, a gentleman called raul and he is the other half or better or bow of the most prominent um medium in paris called simone and uh, he's all, and she's got a, a woman that works for her called um, El Elsie. And between the three of them, you have this dynamic that Simone has become very frail and ill because of all the seancing and mediuming that she's been doing. And Raoul has been kind of taking the, the money and sort of like pimping her out as this great medium. And they have this one client called Madame X who is coming for her last seance. And this is going to be the last seance that Simone ever, ever, ever does. And there's a number of sort of like toing and froing about whether she should do it or not. And at one point, it's like she's being conjoled into it by Raoul. And Elsie is there going, no, 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 Monsieur, you mustn't do this. And then on, then it sort of swings to you know him saying, actually, no, no, don't do this. I feel bad about this now. And Simone going, no, I promised. And Simone never breaks a promise. So therefore she goes to do it. And then the, so Madame X turns up, um, this large woman, and I, I was talking a bit more about her a bit later. Um, and she turns up and then she asks the question that the manifestations that come out of a seance, you know, the, the ectoplasm that comes away from the medium, does it actually manifest as a real genuine child? Because it turns out she's trying to contact her child, Emily. And... So it does it sort of manifest itself as a physical thing uh, to which Raoul says, yes, it possibly could, but you mustn't touch it because current theory is that that actual form is part of the medium. So if you remove that, you're going to remove part of the medium. And then, and then uh, uh, Madame X says, oh, well, I want to tie up your hands to the chair to show that there's no crafty shenanigans going on and that this is absolutely real. Um, begrudgingly, Raoul then says, yes, uh, so he's actually tied to the chair. And then as the child manifests from the medium, Madame X picks the child up and runs off with it. Of which, whilst this is going on, Raoul's trying to free himself, and eventually he frees himself to find Simone has died. And that's the synopsis of the Agatha Christie story. And certainly the synopsis of the text, yeah. Mine was... Um... 
somewhat different to that. <laughs> go well, let's have a double synopsis from your memory. How did it go? Um, <clears throat> so um, mine had been contemporised, and um, it goes back to what we we're looking at in class um, a couple of weeks back with Bart's and um, functions proper and indices. So um, there were times there where you were saying stuff, and I thought, oh my god, functions proper. Oh, oh my god, yeah, plot point there. <laughs> um, but, um, you've got um, Declan and. Um, I can't remember the woman's name, but since she's got an Irish accent, we're going to call her Mrs. Brown, all right? Okay. Um, <laughs> so. Right, okay. Declan and Mrs. Brown are Irish and a married couple, but they're working as um, butler and maid to a woman in a big house. Um, now, Mrs. Brown um, is pregnant, and she's the psychic. And Declan has um, organised to get a person in to help them since she's so heavily pregnant um this person is um an afghanistan refugee who lost her daughter during bombings and that's why she's quite the country um now mrs brown obviously famous psychic um, but doesn't want to do it while she's pregnant because um, it takes an awful lot out of her and um Declan tries pressuring her and she says um, no. And then um, the refugee says, oh, it'd be a chance to speak to my daughter and I really, really miss her. And she's sort of like dead and you're about to have a life, kid. And um, she says, oh, go on then. Um, so they have the seance. Again, there's the whole thing with the ectoplasm. The, um, she's told, don't touch the ectoplasm because we don't know what will happen. And what happens with the radio play is that obviously the refugee touches the ectoplasm when her daughter has appeared, um, takes it away, but in taking it away, she's actually taken the child, the unborn child, away from Mrs. Brown. Oh, okay. So it's not so much killing her as sort of like removing the child from her, and yeah. That's but still one. taking, it is still that taking the part. So yeah, you're right. So you've got, you, you've got the key points that make the story. Yep. And then everything else is just completely built up around that to create that same story in a different environment and a, and a different way. Sound like they added to characters and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think to it? How interesting. Um, I really liked it. I really liked it in um, the way that it was written. I mean, Agatha Christie just has a wonderful phrase, uh, turn of phrase about her and the way that she just writes. Um. There was it was very interesting in in the way that she described things because Raoul was a French man. <laughs> They're in Paris. <laughs> it's just that whole kind of like and has other French men and he's a French man, a French fellow. And then she's a French woman and they're all French, you know, in France. And it's a bit like that going on all the way through it. So you kind of got to kind of pick pick through some of the stuff that's not aged so well. But the key, the core story was really nice. It was a real character piece that you've got between the two main characters of Raoul and Simone and I really liked the interplay between them I liked that it really did start off almost like a manipulation story where you know um, in a patriarchal way where the man is manipulating the woman in order to get money and all that kind of stuff and then it flipped into this other side of things of him suddenly realizing that it's actually not, you know, he gets a bad feeling about it before the seance and he tries to stop it at that point. And that it's, it's there where she says, no, you were right before. I can't just let people down. I My word is my bond side of things. And that was, it was more to do with that than it was the end bit. The end bit was kind of like, oh, it has to be supernatural. Um, but I liked that little idea, that, that tiny little idea that, the ectoplasm was part of the medium that the ghost can only manifest because it actually takes mass from the medium to be able to manifest, which is a really nice explanation for a ghost, I think, because it stops everything just appearing. It has to have a, a, a trade off. Yeah, I like that. Um, one of the things that um, the radio play was doing or appeared to be doing um, whilst I was listening to it was in the first half, um, because you've got Declan um, saying, oh, give us a grand and we'll organise a seance for you and pushing this, um, you're left with the 
feeling that this is all a rip off that they're trying to sort of like get money off the refugee and that um, these seances aren't going to be real. So it was almost like there was a twist towards the end of it's not a rip off. It is actually a real seance. And then there's the other twist of and yeah, it's um, yeah, she's touching the ectoplasm and baby snatching and all of these things. So, yeah, I mean, but the radio one did have a couple of odd bits that I didn't know what the hell was going on. Right. OK. So in what, in what way? Um, re the refugee woman. Yeah. Um, do I sound racist for not remembering her name? Uh, yeah. Right. No, no. I mean, <laughs> look, names are hard when it comes to characters. This is not people that you've actually met. So there is a big uh, difference in that. So, yeah, um, refugee woman. Um, she'd she did kept cutting away to bits where she was talking with an orthopedic surgeon who was making a special shoe for her because she'd lost some toes all oh, right okay and it's just why what has that got to do with the story i mean yeah. she was meant to have lost them at the same time that she lost a daughter and maybe yeah but was it a landmine um no i think it was the um, shelling on the houses. Um, oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it was the so what they were doing was they were trying to build um, a tragedy story into this, so that you had the refugee came from a tragedy story, and they were trying to fill in that background to that character, weren't they? They were trying to by using um, a tangent to be able to fill in the gaps of the character rather than everyone because in the original story it's very very quick it takes place in like one street and two rooms right you know so you you're not really going off anywhere and actually you really don't find anything out I mean, the whole thing of madam x for example she's called madam x and they actually say that in the story she's called madam x because her identity has to remain anonymous to the medium um she's not married to malcolm is she <laughs> her daughter emily x <laughs> um <laughs> Otherwise known as Am, um, yeah. So, but that's why that was there. So it's you know. So it sounds like what they've tried to do in the adaptation is wait, like you say, you have the key markers in the adaptation, um, and then they tried to sort of fill out around it. So they've they've completely changed the characters on top of the story, and then in changing the characters, needed to build more background to those characters. So they were taking it off in tangents in order to be able to do the exposition. Yeah, which um, which just left me a little bit puzzled towards the end as to why, what was the whole point of that. It didn't really detract from the story, but I don't think it added anything to it either. Yeah, it sounds like there. Um, I've been reading a book, and I can't remember who it's by, called Adaptations and Appropriations, and it's a study into adaptation theory. Right. Um, and that kind of goes on about appropriations within stories, where... You, when you're adapting, you have to appropriate the right sort of elements of it, you know. Absolutely, and so you're yeah. you are either appropriating, like with what Agatha Christie has done. So she wrote something that's set in what would have been contemporary France around about the turn of the century. I think yeah. this was first published in 1926, something like that. And so, and it was, and it was very broad strokes because it was a short story. So she's trying to get to the nuts and bolts of it but part of what it is that she has she wrote was this little character piece that ends with you know that's built around the seance but it's mainly about the character and it sounds like what they have done in the radio thing is they've done the adaptation of the seance bit but have not really appropriated the character um conflict and created a completely new character conflict rather than appropriate it from the from the original story yeah, yeah, we're sort of like giving the impression that Declan is a little bit of a chancer. I think we're introduced to him when he's sort of like been trying to import some stolen meat. Um, that's not a euphemism. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so he's a little bit dodgy and we're sort of like shown that they're in financial hardship. Um, but yeah, all of these seem like slight distractions away from, I mean, from what you said about your story, um, she dies at the end. That's good. I was blown away by the whole, right, she's stolen the... Her dead child has now been manifest in, from the medium's 
um, fetus. Actual child, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was kind of a sickening and horrific idea, which I thought mm. was really, really well done. And actually still, and that really does align, you know, we say with with the with the Agatha Christie story. The interesting thing with the Agatha Christie story is because she's already weak and frail at that point because she's done this so many times that she is now, you know, there's a little part of it was would she have died anyway, whether the woman had picked up the child or not. So there is a little yeah. part of that. So I suppose giving it the child has been taken effectively the mass that was making the child has now made another child outside the body actually ups the stakes a little bit on that end bit so i do like the way that they've done that that's it's sticking with the initial concept but then taking it in a different direction which is really nice yeah and pushing the envelope that little bit further but again i think Whilst I might have, mine might have had a better ending than yours, I think yours sounds as though it had got much better content with it being Agatha Christie's writing all the way through, whereas yeah. this was a little bit um, adapted. <laughs> well, adapted isn't always really bad, but it does sound like it was um, by certain numbers. You know, yeah. Really, yeah. And and sometimes that can really... I mean, the interesting thing, as we know, Agatha Christie can be problematic and has been in a number of her titles. Hmm. And a number of the things that she's written. And there was um, there's a little bit of foreknowledge that was causing me a bit of a problem. Because during the actual thing itself, Madam X is described as a large black lady, right? Who's very large and very black is how she's described, right? And you're sitting there going, oh, Agatha, why have you done this? But then you realise that she is a very, very large lady, right? When she turns up, she, she definitely enjoys her cross on all five. Um, but the blackness they're describing is actually what she's wearing because she is in mourning for her child that has died and that's who she's trying to contact right And but there's a part of me that's kind of like I have been a bit unfair in her writing because of my knowledge of other stuff that Agatha Christie has done that made me go she's very big and very black and you're like going oh no you've done it again you know am I going to be able to talk about this <laughs> Yeah, she um, yeah she does have a habit of dropping um, yeah yeah playing the race card quite badly in um, a lot of her stuff yeah yeah so uh, but luckily on this occasion all the racism was actually just the characters themselves all the yeah, French there, was, there were some nice touches with that actually in the adaptation so um, when Declan is talking to the refugee um, he's got her over so that she can do some cleaning around the house. And he says, um, oh, um, I'll give you one of these. Um, you probably don't know what it is. Um, it, we call this a broom over here. And we use it for stuff like uh, sweeping the carpet. You've probably got one of those collections of sticks where you come from, haven't you? And she says, no, we usually use a vacuum cleaner. Um, <laughs> and it turns out she's got a degree in engineering and she's a former translator for... Um, was he? I can't remember now, but yeah, she's a former translator. Um, so yeah, it's like subverts what we usually think for as stereotypes there, which I quite liked. That's very interesting, actually, isn't it? Because in a funny sort of way, that's exactly what I did with Agatha Christie. I stereotyped what she usually does with characters of colour. Yes. Um, so that caused me to do that. But then she does it. I'm just going to read. This is the opening section. I'll read the opening section of this. This will probably get us shut down by the Agatha Christie um estate because they do seem to have been very tight on her you've not been able to find the text anywhere there's no audio book of this available on youtube only the adaptation so this might get a shutdown so it's raul do raul de brill crossed the seine humming a little tune to himself he was a good looking young frenchman of about 32 with a fresh colored face and a little black mustache ho -he -ho. <laughs> And that's not the only time she mentions Frenchman. Then it goes on. The door was opened by an elderly French woman. You know, you're already you're in Paris, but you still need to place it. Everyone's French. <laughs> I think next time I go back to Paris, I'm going to start referring to everybody as "Excuse me, Frenchman." Uh, excuse me, <laughs> yeah. Um... So and that's the opening page. That's just the opening page. But once you get through all that, it's really, really good. Um, it doesn't have any outstanding lines. It's not like... 
um, you know, where you get that that killer line. It's not quite like that. Uh, she does keep saying Monsieur in it as well, just to double down on the on the Frenchness or the Frenchiness and the Frenchman. But yeah, as a concept, I think the story idea was really, yeah. really strong. Very, very good. Yeah. And yeah, as you say, the dynamic between the characters where you've got sort of like somebody who's um got this ability and um is being urged to do it one last time. Um, yes. and and the whole idea of somebody wanting to talk to I mean it's almost like we're going back to the monkey's paw isn't it with um a character wanting to do something that they shouldn't yes yeah and it's, it seems to be a big driving thing it's that I mean it kind of goes back to Campbell's idea doesn't it it's kind of the call to adventure and denying the call to adventure and this is kind of a little bit like that it's the you're being they have to be cajoled into doing something that ends up being really bad for them but it's still that starting point of of how the character works and, and what's going through the character's mind. Um, how were seances presented in the original text? Were they presented as something that was acceptable and um, a regular part of society? Yes. Because in this one, they were sort of like saying how um, they were frowned upon and um, she would have been hung for witchcraft um, a few, yeah, a few hundred years earlier. But yeah, I did think that obviously Agatha Christie's time seances were kind of popular. Um, yeah, they... it's actually she is the most popular medium in Paris, Simone. And that, and the reason that she's like this is, you know, she's the most popular. She's the most sought after. Everyone wants a reading from Simone, the medium. Um, so she's almost celebrity in this field and the way that it's described as well what's really nice is because I, I know a, a bit about that and the way that they used to do seances back then the actual seance itself wasn't a bunch of people sat around a table it was the seance the, you know the medium sat back in a cut in a curtained area you know so you don't quite see what's going on the set back so you do have that kind of feeling of is this actually just going to be a con because of the way that she sort of sat in this alcove with all the curtains around her yeah. And then all the mystical stuff and all the kind of ectoplasma stuff happens within that alcove. So it's not like the holding hands seance that we get. Definitely more kind of like that Victorian parlour seance, and that you know, which was very, very popular around about the 1860s. So it's about the 1880s. It's, it was very much like that. So, you know, it did feel, feel much like that. And I, and I believe that that went on longer in Europe because it's interesting. I find it very interesting that Agatha Christie set this in Paris. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that I'd read about um, seances um, was that um, many of the female mediums um, would do it naked um, just so that they were, one, it was a distraction technique, and two, it meant that you got bigger audiences as people went, oh, let's go and see this naked. It's because they won for yeah. the dads. Um, yeah. Mothers uh, of the dead children going, can you get hold of my little Emily? And the dads are there going, yeah, yeah, we'll take you along to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was there was a lot of stuff like that going on. In uh, um, I mean, it's an amazing story, actually. It gets, it gets brushed off a little bit. But the whole history of stage magic, for example, goes all the way back to seances in parlours, you know, and that's actually the term parlour trick where it all, all goes back oh. to. Yeah. So what basically once he started getting, because Houdini was doing his thing, but remember Houdini was ex excapology. So the big acts weren't about cutting people in half and making people disappear as much, but he started doing that in order to poo poo what the, what the, the psychics were claiming. And yes. so he was reenacting what they were doing. And then once they sort of like started getting caught out in the parlours, they then all started going, oh, yes, this is just entertainment. A bit like Jeremy Kyle did once. Um, and that guy from Infowars did it as well, where he has to declare it in order for tax purposes, he had to declare it as entertainment, not reality. So that's what they then had to start doing. And that then moved it. So, But before that happened, to get bigger audiences, like you were saying, they were moved to the stage. So they were doing the same thing that they were going to individual parlours on stage to larger audiences. Then it started getting called out. So then they started becoming magicians. And so they, they took the same techniques and started turning it into magic shows along the line. So that there's a massive sort of like interconnection between 
the big magic shows and going all the way back to, you know, the psychics of the parlours in the Victorian times. And I think one of the things that I really liked about this was the fact that it's Agatha Christie and we're not used to the supernatural. In each one of her stories that I've read before, um, Poirot or Miss Marples will solve the case from practical methods and with this one it was practical 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 and then suddenly last two minutes here's a bunch of ectoplasm you've got sort of like a formerly pregnant woman there going where's my baby gone yeah um, and yeah. agatha christie's story is very similar it, it wasn't so much practical but it was definitely talky 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 yeah. and you weren't really sure who was manipulating who you know you are thinking about yellow wallpaper at this point and is there gaslighting? And is you know, so is he pulling some threads and she thinks she's a medium? You really do get a sense of that, which was really yeah. clever character play. And then he gets his hands tied up, and then re-electoplasm, dead, dead psychic woman runs off with a child. And then it ends, it just ends so quickly at that point, you know, and it leaves you so many questions at the end. <laughs> it's all like they go, where's the woman gone with the child? Does the child survive? Is it like pet cemetery? Is it evil now? And he's going to go stabby stabby on everyone. You know, it's like, it's, it's an amazing end it really is an amazing end to which you don't see coming because it's just so quick. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. And again, that's part of his appeal. Um, and I get, I suppose that's why it was annoying me with the orthopedic shoe. Um, <laughs> what, why? Why are we looking at this woman's foot? And yeah. Well, maybe we've got a new thing because, you know, like you've got the MacGuffin. Yes. The item that is obviously going to be very important later on in the story. Yep. And then there's another one, isn't there? There's someone's gun. Um, is it Chekhov's gun? Chekhov's gun. There's another one of yep. those, isn't it? Um, maybe we should have the orthopedic shoe. As the, the orthopedic shoe is a part of a story that actually has no no reason to be there to drive the story forward or even any form of character development. It is just purely a tangent to fill time. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, Agatha Christie's clumpy boot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's not Agatha Christie's, is it? That's the thing. It's not actually an Agatha Christie's. It wasn't, yeah. That's... It's the adaptation, isn't it? But it could be it's an adaptation. It's, you know, the, the comfy boot is basically when somebody is adapting somebody else's story and they create a side story that doesn't drive anything forward at all for no other reason than padding. But it's, but it's not quite padding in the same way. It's got to be a side story for no so, yeah. reason. Hitchcock's McGuffin, um, Chekhov's <laughs> rifle, and yeah. The adaptation, the adapter's clumpy boot. <laughs> there we go. We have a new theory. Yes, uh, a new, new theory to add into um, adaptation theory. There. Right. Are you ready for the for what we're on next week? Let me ask the question then. Let's go for this. So, Ash, what are we reading next week? Next week, we are reading the Confession of Charles Linkworth. That's a ghost story by E. F. Benson. Oh. E.F. Benson, I know. Yep. Can you read me that title again? Um, if I can open my because phone. Because it was a... Oh, I've got Charles uh, and Confession. The Confession of Charles Linkworth, a ghost story. Linkworth, yep, got it. Yep. And there's wow. a version of it up on YouTube. Brilliant. So we should both be um, listening to the same one this week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I th that was quite an interesting experiment, though, to actually have the two different synopsis. Yeah, it was. As, a, as yeah. an interesting thing. I don't want to do it that often, but definitely an interesting experiment um, to look at. Well, brilliant. Um, well, that. that was a fantastic, another fantastic discussion there, Ash. Likewise, yes. And yeah. we've got a theory yeah. out of this one as well. We've got clumpy boot yeah. theory out of this one. So... Um, and I and you you wait. That really is going to turn up in one of my essays. <laughs> <laughs> he employs clumpy boot theory, you know. Yes. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Can't wait for it. Brilliant. Well, thanks a lot for that, Ash. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Yep. See you later now. Bye now. Bye. Bye.